So thank you so much for joining us today at Oborn Contemporary. I, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing two gentlemen um, to you that I've worked with uh, for a short period of time with Peter and for a little bit longer with Dominic. Um, they'll be in conversation regarding uh, their work together as well as uh, the images that we're surrounded with, which are a part of the exhibition, The Rift, um, a regard on Dominic's time spent in Africa, as well as the connections he's made with both the land and the people uh, who live there and inhabit the land. Um, Dominic Nar is a photojournalist who also keeps a fine art practice that toes the line between uh, fine art photography and also documentary. So it's a pretty interesting um, and undefined area um, which uh, keeps us on our toes. Uh, he f cut his teeth as a photojournalist um, at the South China Morning Post. Um, and then went to Ryerson University and thereafter has been in Africa um, as well as many other places traveling um, as a photographer for Time magazine and he's also a nominee of Megan Photos. Uh, Peter Wieben is an American-born artist who lives in Cairo. He has been collaborating with Dominic on a number of book projects um, and he works in design as well as small publications. So I'm going to let them take it away and we'll be your willing hosts for an hour or so. <laughs> I'd be remiss without <coughs> thanking Donald Oborn, pardon me, for uh, having us in his gallery. And uh, I'd also like to welcome back Natalie McNamara, our director. We're happy to have her back in space. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking Donald, Natalie, Rachel, and Steph for putting on this really beautiful exhibition of Dominic's work and for giving us the chance to talk today. It's a huge uh, honor and thrill for me to be here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to picking Dominic's brain as much as possible um, on a few different topics. Um, I met Dominic under some pretty strange circumstances. I was living in Egypt in 2011. And on the night of January 27th, he came to our door uh, to live in our flat for a period of about 16 days when he was covering the, the chaos um, of the Egyptian revolution. Um, and from the first time I met him, I found him just be a fascinating person. His lifestyle and the, the way that he goes through the world, I think is unlike anyone I ever met before. Um, so we spent a lot of time during those crazy days sitting on my balcony in Cairo just speaking about what his life was like um, and how he made photos and how he lived his life. Um, but for me, one thing that I've always wondered, Dom, too, is when you arrive in a new place, uh, I just sort of try to see it from your perspective of coming to this door, this closed door, and this moment of waiting for the door to open and seeing what's on the other side. And I was wondering if you could start by talking a little bit about what it's like going into a new situation where you don't know what to expect. Um. All right, again, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I, I don't think about it too much. I usually just try and take each step as it goes. I, um, I don't know, I, I'm sure everybody has traveled and I, I'm not one to plan things ahead or have, you know, I usually book my flight a day before, two days before. Sometimes we're in emergency cases, like if anything's happening, we're, we're, on the, we're going to the airport without even knowing if there's a flight and when the flight happens. So it's quick moving and you're just always on the go. What's it, what's it like to receive that call? Because I think in m most people's typical lives, it's, it's not the case that they're called on to move immediately from one place to the next, so. W we were waiting, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Like, I was debating with Patrick Witte, who was the uh, international photo editor at Time at the time, trying to debate if it's time to go, do we stay, is it gonna be big, is it gonna be small? You, you know, that's, that's the big part, is it, because you wanna be there before it really happens, but you don't wanna be there and nothing happens, because then you wasted a flight. But sometimes you have to risk it. You have to go and waste that flight. And if nothing happens, you come back. Luckily, I wasn't on the Mandela dead watch detail, but the amount of times the guys had to fly to Johannesburg to like sit outside on the hospital, in just in case he does pass away, was insane. So I, th I think those guys were really miserable all the time. Because, the, the, yeah, they just flew back and forth. And some channels, you know, their entire budget for 2013, or 2012 even, were gone already. Because they were all the, high, you know, the scare they, something happened to him or he's gonna go soon. So I think in that case, uh, it's uh, yeah, not so good. But with that, we were discussing, we're just planning. And I think the big thing with Egypt was that Friday prayer was a, we were probably 
we thought might be a big one. We didn't think it was going to be that big, but we definitely thought there might be some action. So are there certain stories that you're following from your base in Nairobi um, that you're sort of looking out for, could this break one way or the other? Am I going to need to be there? Um, mm -hmm. And how do you sort of balance that with your, I mean, the work we're seeing here is work that's sort of based out of Nairobi and you popping around Africa. So yeah. how, do you, how do you balance the two? I can't. Uh, so you have to really separate it. Um, I thought you could do it both, but um, because you're always on the go, you're not thinking, you're not really planning and thinking shoots. So this project was a bit of both, but mostly it was planned, this is what I wanted to get. This is what I was looking for. So going to the volcano, there's no news event, there's nothing. I'm just going to spend money, my own money, get to the volcano somehow um, and get those pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's different than news where you're like, I don't know, where where it's much fast paced and you're doing it for a magazine, you're doing it for somebody. Like nobody, I really thought people would publish pictures of like volcanoes, but nobody did. And it's most of my personal work never gets published, um, which is bizarre. I, uh, I just went into a nuclear plant in Japan and I begged everybody because it cost a bit of money to fly down and I needed a translator and all that um, to like put me on assignment for this project because we're going into a nuclear plant. You'd think be exciting, and it was literally pulling teeth out of somebody. Um, in the end, it worked. Uh, I paid myself, paid my way down, and on the morning before I went in, time was like, oh yeah, we definitely want those pictures. So, but you, I don't know, you don't wait for for somebody to. I think that's the difference with personal work. You don't wait for somebody to give you the okay. Mm -hmm. So with this sort of uh, moving around to these, I mean, you cover disasters, you cover conflict, uh, you cover upheaval. Uh, how do you make space, uh, whether physically or emotionally, to get yourself in a place where you can work going into these situations? Um, I, I, I don't know. I thought of Haiti. You know, was, that, that was a little nuts because I was in New York. No, I was in D.C. And the Haiti earthquake happened. And, uh, you know, I, I was working for the Wall Street Journal at the time. And they were like, OK, go to the DC office, pick up satellite gear, you know, because they no internet, nothing. So you need to file with satellite uplinks. Um, I didn't, I had running shoes on. I didn't have any boots. And I was thinking rubble, you know, earthquakes, bodies. So, um, you know, I was in the airplane texting the Wall Street Journal editor going like, hey, I need boots. Can you find boots in Puerto Rico before I get on another plane? And a guy showed up in a truck and opened it up. And there were like 100 boots. You know, just outside the airport. And I picked the ones that I liked, they fit, and then I wanted to pay. He's like, don't worry about it. Well, she's strong, got it. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, <laughs> black, like, you know, black van, no, no, you know, blackout windows, and, you know, yeah. lots of boots. So. <laughs> and, then we, and then we got into a private jet, you know, like with jet engines. To go to Haiti? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, but then the, we were a bit late. The 82nd Airborne closed the airspace, so we had to turn back. Um, and then we went to San Diego, and then there we were trying to find an airport close enough to Haiti. But because we had our own plane, that's cool, it only happened once. <laughs> uh, we're, we're like, where do you want to go? We're like, there. Um, we uh, had our own generator. So uh, all the other journalists, the first responders didn't have anything. So there was no power. So we had actually a generator. So that helped. Yeah, and uh, when you mentioned your equipment, one thing that struck me watching you work when you were living at our place was the sort of weird equipment that you wouldn't think about that you would need the, the sort of first aid stuff and the protection, yeah. the communication stuff. So do you have like, I mean, I guess it's, it's not the typical demands of a normal lifestyle. Do you have like a kit that you yeah. sort of take? How do, how do you pack? I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, well, I have sort of the light kit when it's not, or like sort of yeah. when I don't need to go into like fighting situations. And then I have the kit um, that's more for like Somalia where um, it's like a bulletproof vest and helmet and a med kit, um, like clotting materials so in case there's a wound, that you, you know, stuff like that. Because you have to, mostly you don't get to a hospital fast enough, so you have to dress the wound knowing that it will take a bit longer to get to, like, respond, like somebody can respond to your injuries. You're, are you, are you, so do you have to do, like, first aid training? Yeah, we have first aid, first aid trainings and specifically for, like, uh, being hurt by, like, Gunshot wounds. Catastrophic or stuff. Yeah, but I, we kind of tell each other that we should do it every year or every six months. And yeah. then last time I did it was three years ago, so okay. I wouldn't <laughs> remember. I, you know, you have to poke like three, three down or two down. But definitely you want to know which one to do it, you know. <laughs> so I don't remember. So um, it's not good. I mean, we're all trying to, I'm trying to get everybody to get, get their, um, their sort of first aid back into gear. 
Um, yeah, it depends exactly where you travel. I'm trying to travel light, but I always have so much stuff with me. So, uh, I'm, I mean, I travel pretty light. I, I even have a mini projector, like a tiny little projector and a speaker, and the, that's my home theater, you know, <laughs> that I can do in any hotel room. Um, so that's, you know, except that. So when you, when you turn up in a place, I mean, uh, you know, you're entering these situations where even the people who live there yeah. aren't used to what's going on. Yeah. It's a strange situation. So getting off the plane, how do you figure out where you're going, what you're doing? Um, I think just one thing is I don't like staying in hotels or anything like that. So we try and find families to stay with, hence you guys. It's just safer. Um, and also the commun community thing, that, you know, it calms us down. Um, but with Egypt and Cairo, you know, the secret police were everywhere. They were watching everybody and they see all these camera guys talking out loud, you know, walking into the hotel. Uh, they know exactly which room they're staying. They probably bugged the room. That didn't happen with me because I stayed with Peter, and that was a kind of it was a safe zone. And we actually started harboring photographers. Remember, it was yeah. just me. Yeah. Then it was like two, three, five, eight, and then suddenly we had like <laughs> 10, 15 guys would come in. Um, uh, Peter also lived really close to a friend of his that um, was the only guy who had internet, because everybody else has internet. The general internet, I guess, company, but this guy had the internet um, that was connected to the stock market. And they shut all the internet, all phone connections down. That's a big thing too. You have to be prepared that you don't have internet, you don't have phone, you don't have anything. And we kind of got a warning that they're going to shut everything down. So we had we you know, called everybody and said, "Okay, this is it. Communication will be out. So we'll be here, here, here. You know, just get everything done." But yeah, this guy has internet from the stock market. So we were filing through this guy's uh, communications. So. In a lot of cases, you have somewhere when you're landing, you know someone in the city somehow, or you yeah. have some sort of fixer. When was a time, or can you think of a time where you landed in a place that was completely unknown? Where it was just entering into a situation where it was new, where you didn't have a contact? Or, or do you tend to research in advance when you turn up? Well, you try and find somebody, call somebody. Um, with like high news situations, you're likely to bump into some, another photographer. Right. For like the tsunami, I was in Hong Kong and I flew from Hong Kong and the entire plane was filled with journalists and photographers and that, I, that I knew. So we kind of like, we'll try and figure it out together. None of us spoke Japanese and I remember flying up from Osaka. We found a plane, we pushed ourselves in um, and then got up to the north and I had a t-shirt on and a light sweater and we we're banking. I wake up and the whole thing's covered in snow. I'm like, oh crap. You know, I didn't even think about that it, there would be snow yeah. or that it would be cold. So you get surprises like that. That was a pretty big surprise. I mean. So one thing I've always wondered, um, again, if we, if we take Egypt as an example, because it's what I know best, right? So it's a city of 20 million people, and on one day, uh, it just turned chaotic. So in any given square, any given time, there could be riots, there could be riot police, there could be tear gas. Um, and I remember you leaving in the morning, sort of like, all right, I'm going to shoot, right? And you had a few preparations that you took with you, mm. but I, I was always really curious, how do you know how to move, like through a city, through a situation? Um, is there a technique, is there an art? How do you place yourself? Um, each, each place is different, and yeah, kinda, you got to go with your gut on this. Like, um, I was in the Intercontinental, right before the phones went off, and um, I was with a couple other press guys, and. We're all debating where we should go for the prayer because it's a pretty good thing when, when there's prayer because you know by 1 p.m. it's over and then shit will go down, you know. So you can position yourself and know that everything else will be blocked after that. Yeah. So we talked and the phones died and then the two, three people I was with, they decided to go to one part. But I, before I, the phone sent down, I, had a, I got a number from a friend of mine. He's like, give this guy a call. He's an Egyptian good journalist. And I called him and he said, don't go there, go over there. Nobody else was going over there. And I was like, this is stupid. Maybe this is a trap. But you know what? But I, my gut said, no, I need to go into this other place. Not the obvious place. And it was the best place. So I don't know. You just got to go with your gut. And I remember you saying, and uh, feel free to tell me if I'm completely off the mark on this, but the morning when you left, on the morning that became the day of rage, you said, uh, I want to go somewhere where I'm alone. Mm -hmm. I want to find somewhere quiet. Even though there was chaos everywhere, noise everywhere, and shooting, you wanted somewhere quiet. Was that um, intentional in terms of how you want to tell the story? Were you looking to be 
apart from anyone else's viewpoint or, or what sort of informs that? No, I think I was just wanted to be away from the press pack. And there, there weren't that many yet. The, most of them came on Friday or Saturday because that's only a few of us were there in the beginning. I think most were based in Egypt, Cairo. I used to be based in Cairo for about three months. Uh, but then I thought, wait a second, I, left, I grew up in Hong Kong. I, I left Hong Kong to move to a really big city as well as pollution is really noisy. What am I doing? So I moved to Nairobi, you know, where I had a farm and with, you know, like horses. And so, um, yeah, uh, no, I, I, mean, I was just looking for quiet moments without anybody being around. I kind of get weird when there's competition. You know, people get a little crazy. Photographers get a little crazy, especially in high intense situations. Everybody's a little jumpy and then one photographer tries to get closer or do stupid stuff, but the other photographer joins because you want to get the same, you know you're being beaten right in front of you. So you kind of do stupid stuff. And it's, I've seen dangerous situations happen right. and people have been killed because I think it's a group mentality is really, really dangerous. Two people is okay. Once it gets anything more than that, it gets uh, unpredictable. I mean. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to ask next. Like, okay, so this is how you sort of follow your gut in terms of figuring out where to place yourself mm. on, the, on the macro scale, but within the situation, you're in a riot or you're in a demonstration or you're in a sort of this area of violence. How do you move? Are you trained to seek cover in certain ways? Like, have you, were you taught how to do that or mm. is it just instinct? Yeah, it's instinct. I love doing it though. It's like, I love reading situations or people. It's one of my favorite things. It's like, I like that I'm doing that more than taking pictures. I think I take pictures because I like reading situations and people. Um, so you're constantly moving, you're constantly watching, you never stay still. You'll get, you'll get, something will happen if you stay still. You know, somebody will notice you because they're like, wait, this guy's been here for like a minute or two. What's he about? What, what, what's his deal? And then two or three others. And then suddenly you've got a whole mob around you. So if you keep moving, they can't really pay attention to you. And I'm always like paying, you know, my radar is like beeping for any like trouble. Anybody who seems sketchy is watching me or, you know, or moving too slowly or has something in his eyes, you know. So I think that radar is, o and checking for doorways, checking for escapes, trying to make sure that I always have an exit. That's a big deal. Like I'm always looking backwards. If I'm moving forwards, I'm always looking <coughs> backwards as well, just to make sure I'm, I'm not going to get blocked in. Um, in Egypt, yeah. that was all the time. I mean, we were trying to figure out which roads were safe. Uh, and um, we try and find each other. Photographers again go get updates. When the phone started working again, we got updates every, every, every minute almost. So it's just, this road's not safe. Just, you got to walk around the whole thing. So, just so that seems information, like. Information, right? So, reading yeah. people is like getting information. But if you can get information any other way, that's good too. So, it's just using that information to make judgment, like clean judgments. You know? Yeah, so that it's like, it almost seems like almost an animal part of your brain that's yeah. working, sort of saying, is there a risk here, is there a risk there, what's the look in that guy's eye, mm. you know, kind of reading them on a, uh, reading people on a really basic level, mm. but then at the same time, I think the work that you produce is really artistic, and you're looking for proportion, and you're looking for light, mm. and you're looking for facial expressions, mm. so I'm wondering, how do you reconcile those? Is it, is it just instinct at this point? Do you think about, I'm seeking this kind of shot, I'm seeking this kind of emotion, or, or how, do you, how do you balance those two? Mm. Well, I don't think I, I'm really bad newspaper photographer, because uh, like, if the light's not nice, I won't take the picture, so it's like <laughs> I'm really picky of, of what, I, what I shoot and how I shoot it, but I, um, I think it's unconscious. The, there's a funny moment when I forget that I have a camera, but I'm shooting. That's like the best. I know I'm making the best work because I'm not aware that I even have the camera in my hand. I'm like interacting with my surroundings and people, and I literally forgot that I took pictures. It doesn't exist. And that's the height. That's, that's when I know it's good. When I feel the camera and the weight of the camera, that's a usually a bad sign that I'm, I'm not, somehow I'm not clued in. So. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten in a situation where you thought that you were too close or that you were in a bad spot? Yeah, there's a few times, you know, just, um, you know, I've been very lucky and also I've, the, cov the stories I've covered, I feel like it wasn't too crazy, um, but yeah, I mean, there's always sort of stupid moments where you should, should have just left, you know, your gut said like, oh, it's just, you know, let's leave now and then you stay for another few shots, you know, nothing, bad pictures and then you get in trouble or if you're in the back of a pickup truck and there's, you know, bombers flying overhead and I'm thinking of my mother, you know, it's like, <laughs> Like, what am I doing here, you know, like, and then, and then, you, you know, it's good days and bad days, you know, like, 
some days you think this is stupid and other days you feel like you're telling a story it's, you know it's it's important mm -hmm. like this uh, your mission is clear you know um, I was lucky that lucky uh, like sort of found my mission and very early when I went to Congo for the first time and uh, rather than just covering the news I mean covering sort of the rebels military we um, stumbled onto sort of a massacre site that was still kind of ongoing and it was some small town not important nobody would have known it existed even uh, nobody would have known that dozens of people were killed children old, an old couple they were kind of holding each other um, and there felt really important to make those pictures I feel it wouldn't even have existed in sort of the memory of, mm -hmm. of, of history if those pictures weren't taken. Um, and there were a few photographers there and I think we really made some noise, you know. We, we, we kind of protested with those pictures. Um, and that's when you have good days. I mean, it was a really bad scene, but the purpose is clear. Mm -hmm. That, that um, for all the bad stuff, this is really important. So, like, you just go through it, you know, you just, just do it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is almost like a humanitarian aim, um, definitely a journalistic aim, but you're also an artist. So, as you're moving around the world and doing these uh, travels and going to these different places, I mean, as we see here, this is an art gallery. So, on the one hand, you're, you're working as a journalist, on the other hand, as an artist. So, is there a tension there between the two? Uh, yeah. I, it's we're in a weird time. I think um, magazines are kind of like dying. Um, the way people report is very quick. Um, it's, there's no there's no there's no time to look at anything. Everybody just clicks away. Things move so so fast through our memory, our our time. I mean, the amount of pages everybody clicks um, a day is, is enormous. So I think the gallery does have an effect that's different, it slows people down. You, you, you can connect with the picture, somehow you don't click it as fast away. Um, and I think with also the book, this book project I'm working on, you can, you can give a different tone, a different speed. I think it's, it's that, it's like being able to hold people a bit longer. Um, I feel like even Time Magazine, it's, it's you know, I even flick fast, you know, yeah. I feel like the, we're just bombarded by visuals that we don't really spend that much time reading the pictures anymore or connecting to it. So it's my job to try and do, like push harder in stopping people. So maybe that's why my photographs are much more, I don't know, I'm, I'm really looking at color, I'm looking at things to really stop people um, and make them look longer. And I think that's everybody's mission anyway. Do you shoot differently when you're on assignment for a magazine than when, I mean, let's say for the trip to the the afar to get the volcano where you know that it's you know you need it for a personal project oh. is it a different mindset well okay so uh, i worked at the south china morning post which is a newspaper in hong kong and i was an intern and then i became a staff photographer and initially it was really great it's great training ground because you got to shoot everything from pr events to portraits to sports to whatever um initially i was taking my own pictures but slowly but surely something happened where I started shooting for the newspaper. I knew exactly what the layout would look like, so of course I'm not gonna shoot a picture like this kind of a bit further away. I knew I wanna go tight, because this is gonna be a vertical on page three. And that kind of scared me, because you're not shooting for you anymore, you're shooting for the newspaper. Which is good, because then you're a good newspaper photographer, but I didn't wanna be that. I wanted to, I guess I wanted to have my own voice and my own sort of authorship uh, in, a, in a sense. Um, I see photography as a visual language, so it was perfecting the language or, or, or finding your own voice. And then I started working for magazines, and initially I shot for myself, but then slowly I noticed that I was thinking of page layouts, I was thinking of the gutter, I was thinking this is where the picture will be, because on the right they'll have a text. So that kind of, that scared me a little. I didn't think that would happen working on mag with magazines, so, mm. yeah. Um, it's not a bad thing, it's just... Sometimes you slip below. Right. Um, I've always been curious with you uh, from when I first met you and learned that you, like a lot of other photojournalists, for a good part of the year live out of a bag, mm. right? So you have, I mean, maybe you can talk a bit about how, how you create a home out of this luggage. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, how is it to live as 
a traveler, like without really a permanent home? Um, yeah, it's, it gets tiring. I think I don't even notice it anymore. But for example, for Toronto, I just I was only going to be here for three days, but I thought I needed a break, so I'm staying here for three weeks um, just so I can go and shop. I, I, we went to the shops, and it was the first time in four or five months that I actually went into a supermarket and like picked the stuff I liked. I was like a kid in a candy store, vegetables, you know, t t tomatoes. And so that was nice. And I thought I could, I'd like to do this for three weeks. This is going to feel really good, you know. And I even bought a bicycle. I'm only here for three weeks, but I was like, I'll sell it again. I'll just feel a little more normal that I can, you know, bike around. Um, I just, okay, I spent three months in Japan covering the Fukushima radiation kind of story. And almost every night I slept somewhere else. So just got a little tiring because you got to make your bed, you know, the tatami kind of floor or in a, you sleep in the car or, so that just got a little tiring. More just the, my body was screaming. It was just like, I, I mean, like really unhealthy, <laughs> you know, um, you eat out of 7-Eleven, you know, rice with beef every day for lunch, for breakfast, for dinner. It's just my body was actually tired and that's when I noticed I needed a break. I would have kept going, but I think the body starts, you know, giving like warning signs that maybe it's time to just take a quick break. Do you think from the early years of living this way until now that you've been changed by it, by the lifestyle and by this constant motion and just the demands of what you do? Uh, yeah, I'm for sure. I'm a lot more skiddy. You know, like a, I think, I think Routine is quite good. It calms you down. You you feel you know confident. I think I'm always paying attention to everything. So you know you're never like really calm. You know I don't sit in a chair and just start reading a book. Um, so I've noticed that picked up. So I think I need to also slow down just so I don't become so skiddy. Um, yeah, it's just I think also when you're younger you just keep moving and you think it's okay. But I'm start, I'm 30 years old now, so I was thinking maybe family or things like that. So you gotta adjust your lifestyle a bit. Yeah, and, and the other thing I was wondering is, do you feel in any way like you were destined to, to live like this? Was this something that oh, no. from an early age you kind of felt this urge to go, or how did you fall into it? No, I just, I remember I saw a doctor when I was like 16 or 17, and he said, whatever you do in your career and life, you're a routine man. Don't do anything that like where you, things change all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I look, I look back and he was totally right. <laughs> I'm really yeah like the body is just not built for this kind of movement. Um, so no, I, I didn't think it was gonna happen. Um, I was very lucky. I uh, I wasn't very good at school. I liked arts though, and I was in theater and all these things. And uh, this photographer called Humaness, he won a Pulitzer for his picture of the helicopter trying to leave the, one of the uh, mil like US military buildings with the line of people trying to go on it mm -hmm. during the Vietnam War. Um, first of all, he said, whatever you do, don't work for the wire. Like, don't sell your copyright. That's one of the first lessons I learned. I learned all these little lessons from different photographers, but he was like, he sold his picture for $25, you know? And it became a Pulitzer Prize winning picture that went everywhere. Um, so he's like, and he's like this, mis you know, not miserable, he's just this grumpy guy. Um, he passed away sadly, but he was just on the same bar, same drink, you know. Um, I remember, and he's like, whatever you do, don't sell your copyright. And I was like, <laughs> ah, lesson number one. <laughs> um, and uh, he kind of saw some of my pictures and uh, said, Dominic, are uh, you good at school? I'm like, nope. <laughs> he's like, great, you just became a photographer. I called the South Australian Morning Post and you're an intern now. So that was it. Um, just like that. I take a, took a few pictures. I didn't even think it was going to be a career. Uh, and the, at the newspaper, they're like, why don't you just follow a photographer around? And I, when I was younger, I was quite like competitive. So I took my mom's camera that was filmed, they had digital, and I shot everybody I was shadowing that day. I was photographing myself, ran, developed the film, and put it on in front of the editor. I was like, I don't want to follow people. Give me a camera right now. And he liked the pictures. And from that next day, I became a photographer. And that was it. And I you know, looked back. Um, so, no, it wasn't planned at all. Um, and those were big bricks, five megapixels, you know, like big cannons. <laughs> like, uh, and the photographers were cool. They, um, like, they taped everything down, so I would, no automatic, no, no aperture, you know, everything had to be manual. So they were really training me. So the first two weeks was a nightmare. I, I never shot all manual. Um, and then uh, after that, it's, I can't even imagine not, you know, working completely in control of the camera.
it was good. So one of the things I just learned about you meeting up with you in this trip is that some of your work in university was going to Detroit to be among basically, how do you describe them? Well, I was looking at uh, sort of inner city right. communities. Yeah. Right. So uh, this was, I mean, looking at the photos, at least from, from my perspective, it looks like a risky situation. Mm. I'm wondering, were you a risk taker from an early age or did you sort of develop this? Like at what, at what point did you? No, I'm, I'm th I think I'm always scared of everything. I was the guy who would be like worried of everything, you know. I wouldn't do anything, but I don't know. That's, so I'm not a risk taker. I guess I am. Um, no, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I don't know. I just, I felt like it was okay. If it was logical in my head, it'd be fine. Like I, I was just curious. I think curiosity beat the risk taking. I never, you know, I didn't think of it as risk. I was just, I wanted to know what was going on. I always feel like people are like, sort of, we're always being lied to or the truth is not clear. I remember I was watching TV somewhere and some news event was going on and I literally, I just figured like, I want to know, I want to be there. I want to really see what's going on. Like I don't, I think it's masking something. I, I need to see it and feel it. Um, and a lot of times it's true. There's a lot of th other things going on around it. Um, my mom called the East Timor. I went to, my, for one of my first trips was go to East Timor in 2006 when the civil unrest was happening. And uh, I, I called my mom at the end of the night, you know, and she's like, God, it looks like everything's burning. And literally, one road was everything was burning. But the next road, you'd be having coffee. You know, it was, yeah. But the way BBC crew was filming, they would just drive down this one road in one way and then drive down the road in the other way. And it looked like the whole city was burning while it was just one street. And the scuffles were scuffles, but it wasn't as dramatic as the TV made it look. And those are little one indications. When you're behind the scenes, you start realizing, you know, it's, and then you want to really try and figure out how to tell the story. You know? Okay, so speaking of digging into situations that are murky and the truth is unclear, mm. you came here from Japan mm. uh, looking at the situation with Fukushima. So what's it like there these days? Um, I don't know. It's live. I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back, you know. Um, no, I think, I think it's, uh, it's complicated. The Japanese, like Tokyo is still seen as sort of the emperor's home and Fukushima prefecture, it's a big area, it's huge, it's beautiful. So it's not, when you hear Fukushima city, it's not next to the Daiichi plant. It's about 60, 70 kilometers east. Um, they're very, they're very uh, loyal to the emperor, to Tokyo. They don't question things. They, uh, it's a very old s s style. Um, they're kind of the samurai, you know, the horses with the samurai guys. Those are the Fukushima guys. So Minami Soma and Soma is just north of the Daiichi plant, like 20, 30 kilometers and 50 kilometers. And that's where this horse, the, the samurai horses come. So they're very loyal. So nobody really asks questions. Everybody, you know, just, just stays quiet. And that lets the bigger people kind of med meddle in things and just keep continue kind of doing things the wrong way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me from your work, your early work in Japan, was that you had shots where you had gone into, I guess it's the exclusion zone is what it's called, the area where it's unsafe to be because of radiation. Yeah. And you ended up making the choice during editing to make an edit with no people in it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder when you're in a location and you're shooting and you're working, do ideas for sort of narrative or stylistic things pop into your head as you're working? Or is that something that comes to you after the fact when you're back, I guess, maybe not at home, but wherever you're based at the time? Um, well, we were talking about that book. So the, the landscape stuff came out because we, Peter and me collaborate a lot. We brainstorm a lot. And he also designs a lot of my books and things like that. Um, so yeah, we were talking about it and it just felt right that there shouldn't be people. Um, Ironically, this time around, I really only focused on people. I realized just landscape, it, it's, it's nice, it's pretty pictures, but it, it, you know, the feeling of the place is, is by looking in people's eyes and look, meet, you know, meeting them through the photographs. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's usually when I leave a place, I get all the ideas and I'm driving and then suddenly it flushes out. So I have to convince whoever's sitting next to me to drive so I can scribble down what's going on in my head. Um, I was driving, back with Tyler Hicks from after Mandela's funeral. I didn't stay for the final funeral because it was a nightmare. And I, I'm, I was running around all of South Africa trying to make pictures. 
to explain this, this big event, and I got nothing. I mean, it was bad. I also got food poisoning, because I think I hit something really bad at one of the uh, stops we did. We drove a car without license, and we only stopped once, and we got gasoline, and we're driving, and we're about 100 kilometers away from the gasoline station, and police chase us down. And we're like, this is weird, we're like, what's going on? We get out, uh, and they're like, you don't have a license. So the gas guy told the police. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then there was a little bit of a shakedown, and then uh, we gave money, and then they gave us change. It's <laughs> 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 the first time I got change back for you know, <laughs> a ticket. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was frustrating. So I'm driving back, I'm driving with Tyler to the airport, and both of us kind of get an epiphany that we should have, like, I was like, I should have just stayed in Johannesburg and photographed the thousands of people who were standing in line, do a portrait session of every one of them. You know, that would explain the Mandela, you know, era. Yeah, of course, I get on the plane and go home and get really angry that I didn't just stay, you know, I was so stressed out. That would have been great. You know, everybody was so happy, too. They just set up a studio, you know. Anyway, you get these ideas when you leave. So, mm. <laughs> it's kind of like that. So, when, when you were in Japan, uh, I don't remember what was going on. I think there was something happening in Central African Republic. Mm. And we were talking on Skype and you said to me, I feel like I'm betraying Africa by mm. being away. Well, it's just I, I'm ba I was based out of there for five years. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you feel like it's your beat. Um, so it was a little weird. It just felt like I needed to be there. You know, you cover things for five years and in the entire continent. I mean, traveled from Senegal to, you know, Egypt, Morocco, down to South Africa, Central African Republic, been there. You know, Somalia, the whole thing. So you feel like this is your beat. Yeah. Um, but I, I realized that maybe I needed a change. You know, I think even now I look at some of the older, not older, just work I, I was editing um, from Somalia. And I th I'm looking at a different perspective. And I think you need to leave sometimes to see what you, what you really got. Like if you stay somewhere too long, you kind of, like it, you kind of get... I don't know, you just don't see anything anymore. And mm -hmm. like the BBC guys get rotated, everybody gets rotated, that's the reason. So you, you know, I think it's BBC is like two or three years. Um, you know, the AP, AFP, they all get rotated constantly. Uh, so, so the photographers don't get like tired or, you know, the, the creativity, the push, the hunger is still there. And I think five years is definitely overstepping. I, mean, I was thinking of buying land, you know, I was like, oh, like, stay here forever, you know, it's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So when did you first go to Africa? 2008. And what was After assignment? graduating, so. Was it for an assignment or for? No, 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 no. Just, just my, uh, I was in Berlin. I thought, I've tried to live in Berlin three times. I've lasted two weeks each time. I'm like, this is going to be great. I speak German. Two weeks later, I pack my bags and leave again. Um, and then I tried again and again. It doesn't, it doesn't work. This was the first time. And I was just, you know, getting to know people. It was my first night out. I, this guy just showed me around, an old high school friend. And I thought, this is great, this is such a good city. Um, I, ha I had my great night, and a friend emails me, like seven o'clock in the morning, I've been up the whole night. Um, and he's like, something's going down in Congo, I think you should go. I'd never been to Africa, and I, was, I booked a flight and left right away. So that was me leaving <laughs> Berlin to go to Congo, to a continent I've never been before. So what, what was it like getting off the plane? What were your first impressions? Oh, it was great, I loved the smell, and I don't know, I just felt really strong. And, in Kigali, you get off the airplane and you, like, you walk onto the tarmac, uh, dirt tarmac. Um, so you, I don't know, you connect right away. Normally, you walk through tubes. You know, che the Cheplakok in in Hong Kong, I mean, you'd never be on the tarmac. You always go through the tunnels. I thought this is, you know, uh, it's a small airport, and I love small airports. I love waiting for a plane. You know, just sitting on, on the grass, just you're, you know, it'll come today, someday. Maybe it's tomorrow. So you're just waiting at the airfield until the, the sound of the plane comes, you know, it's great. I think that's what, what attracted to me. It was a very, it was a very simplified way of, of experiencing things. Um, yeah, I took a bus from Kigali to, to the border and then stepped over and Gom. I had $500 in my pocket that I borrowed from my parents. Um, and I lost, I think, 200 or 300 before even entering the country because I got like shaked down by the by the border guy, you know, he's like, I'm not going to give you a visa. And I was really, I was like, I'm confused, you know, I've never been really out. 
Uh, so I lost a lot of money just trying to get a visa. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I always bring a little bit bottle of whiskey with me now. So that's like $25 and worth a lot more, you know, so. I know that border guard, it's still the same guy. So now when I go cross over, he's like, eh, Dominic, thinking he can get a lot of money out of me. And I'm like, not, any, not anymore. Yeah. Do you think it was tougher to develop as a human being who goes to these different places and has to relate to tons of people from different cultures, different languages, or to develop as a photographer? Uh, I, grew up, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I've, I've always been the foreigner. I've never felt like I was home. I think that's a crucial thing. Like, I always felt like I was not home always felt like I was not really from here or traveling in a way. And in Hong Kong, I would painstakingly try and fit in. So it's like 36 degrees, 99% uh, humidity. They really literally tell you 99% humidity. That's like walking through water. And, uh, you know, most foreigners would have shorts on and flip-flops. But no, I wanted to blend in. So I wore a shirt, long pants, you know, sweating like crazy because I, you know, the Regular Chinese wouldn't wear shorts, you know, always wear long. So painstakingly try and fit in, but I'm six foot three in Hong Kong, I never will fit in, you know, so. But that kind of let me, that I'm really in t tuned to people, because I, yeah, because of that reason. Um, so I feel comfortable anywhere. Speaking again of Africa, one of the things I've learned about you since I've known you is that you're always looking out for novel ways to get around. So whether it's getting the bike here or talking about different pickup trucks you'd like to own or uh, when, you <laughs> when you were in Kenya looking to rent, uh, I think you were looking to buy or rent a Jeep to do a Jeep I trip, yeah. road trip. How, how does um, travel and transportation play into your work? Well, the, like the dream travel is that you live in your car, you know? I mean, maybe not for everybody, but like, a, I, you know, that sounds a little weird. Uh, <laughs> but I guess like when, because you're like, great, I could just, my home will be the car. And then when I drive from Nairobi to Kampala, I'll bring my home with me. You know, I'll have my books and everything. That was, that's sort of the dream um, job. So yeah, we're always looking at cars. I mean, even, I was looking at cars on Craigslist here. It's stupid, of course, I'm not gonna buy a car. But I think that, um, that, that kind of dream that you have a car means like you're home, like in a home, that you live somewhere. Mm. One of my buddies, uh, maybe he's watching, he, uh, he always buys a car wherever he goes. So he has a, like tons of cars and then he tries to sell them again. And, and every, every time I get a new picture of his like, and so if he's in Australia, he'll have a very Australian car. If he's in South Sudan, he has like a Land Cruiser, the same ones the rebels have, you know? Um, it, it just, it's funny. And Haiti, he bought two cars, you know? As soon as he, got, but it was smart. As soon as he got to the earth, like to the earthquake, he bought two cars, guess what? There were no cars. Within like two, three days, every rental car was booked. Avis, before they sent food supplies, they were sending cars. Brand new cars were coming in for people to rent because they knew everybody needed rentals. Um, I don't know. We're, I guess we're always working with logistics and cars and, and transportation. Uh, I don't know if Tyler uh, should tell this, but he told me that when he went to the Philippines, the, the typhoon hit, hit and you couldn't get anywhere with, with a car. So he, he like rented a mountain bike and started riding with his mountain bike to areas. And I was like, well, what did you do when you got to an area where you couldn't ride? He said, I carried it. And then uh, he would photograph and carry the bike on, you know. So I think transportation is like a really big deal for us. It gets us to where we need to go. And do you think it, it changes the way you see? I mean, in some ways, because a lot of these are very sort of out of the way places. And I think some of them are moments that you maybe didn't intend to capture, but you saw by the side of the road or something like that. So do you find that depending on how you're moving through a place, you come upon a story in a different way? Yeah, I, I think you're usually going for something, or at least you need to narrow down your shooting scope. You know, I think the <coughs> worst case is if you don't know where you're going and you start walking, it's okay, but it helps when you have a bit of a, a goal or direction. It'll always change, like you'll never make it. Um, uh, my buddy Ko Sasaki in, in Japan, when we drive together and we're going, we're, we're going to go to see somebody in the mountains, we can't tell them when we'll be there because it takes us forever to get, because we keep stopping and then taking a small road and then the mist comes in and we freak out and literally the trip takes 15 minutes and four hours later we arrive because we're like just constantly branching off. <coughs> it's good to have a goal, but yeah, allow yourself to get lost. Yeah, Getting lost is good. Know. Yeah, I was going to ask, has there ever been a time where you just got completely lost? And yeah, loads. It's great. <laughs> no, it's really great. Uh, or breakdowns in the middle of nowhere and no phone connection. 
Uh, they're great. I don't know. I'm starting to calm down because you can't do anything. You're, you're really just, you're just going to have to deal with it. And I learned how to fix my own engine because I knew what was going wrong. Um, but somehow that's really cool. Those are cool moments. I remember those moments really well. What do you think is the most remote place you've ever been? Whoa. Hmm. Remote? Most days of travel to get there, or like you were the most, the most isolated. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> um, I think like Eastern Gabon on the Cameroonian border was pretty <coughs> hard. Uh, like, I don't know, lots of traveling by boat. And, you know, you definitely know you're really off the beat when you start going down rivers for a couple of days. Um, we were going to a gold mine that was, um, that nobody really had documented yet. Yeah, you're pretty out there. Um, is it a weird feeling? I mean, uh, I would be incredibly anxious <laughs> <laughs> knowing that I was so far away from, uh, I don't know, I guess. I was anxious. I don't like the jungle. The, it's so noisy, you know, and, and you never see light and everything's wet and everything's trying to crawl up your legs. Um, so I'm not a jungle guy. I like the desert. So when I was working in the Nuba Mountains, actually that's pretty remote. I don't think it's remote because I liked it. You know, I love the journey there, but actually, you gotta fly to Yida camp, which is on the southern, like the northern part of South Sudan, bordering Sudan, and then you gotta drive for like a day or two, depending across the border. So illegally entering a country that usually is kind of sketchy, um, avoiding any kind of battle lines, and then you get into Nuba Mountains, which is one of my favorite places in the world. But you're, there's no shops, there's nothing. Water comes from come from wells. There's no internet. There's no phones. Nothing. It's beautiful. So how do you know before you set off for a place that it's, I don't want to say it's going to be worth it, but like to, you're going to get a picture, right? Like this, I remember you saying, I'm going to go get a picture of a volcano. Mm -hmm. I want a picture of a volcano, but it was a two day drive through the middle of that desert, right? This is the afar? It, yeah, part of that. So you're driving through that horrible heat. I mean, yeah, yeah, how do you fun. determine whether or not to go in that situation? I don't know. You follow your gut again. I don't ever, like either you go or you don't. I remember seeing a talk when I was young uh, with the seven, photo seven photographers. And a lot of people were asking questions that I had as well of like, you know, how do you go? And, and I realized there's no answer to it. You just need to do it. Like there's no, it's either you do it or you don't. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of debate if it's worth it or not. You know, I mean, once you're committed to it, you just go. So, yeah. so in this exhibition or in this work, you at first you called it Rift, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. So how did your fascination with that start? What was it about the Rift Valley? I, I don't know. I've been traveling along it so many years. Um, I was just trying to say something a, a bit different about the Rift, the experience. And I just, it's a sort of a personal journey, a collection of images that I've that connected with me, personal situations that I can never forget. Um, and I've been really lucky to be able to move around the space like that. Um, and I kind of packed my bags again to kind of live on the road. So it's a bit of a, maybe not, a, I'll be back, but I, I, I don't know when I'll go back. So it's a bit of a finale, yeah. Are there, do you think, commonly held misconceptions of that part of the world that people have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's, I was shooting a lot of youth, I was shooting a lot of like young kids and I don't know, I, I obviously, I don't know what, what is the perception of East Africa, Africa, you know? I, I think a lot of people just think of it as this one space with one language or one kind of feeling and every, everywhere, every little town is different than everything else and things are moving so fast. Um, one of the things that attracted me to Nairobi was my parents grew, like lived in Hong Kong for 40 years. And at the time, my dad got there like 1970s, or 1972, I think. And Hong Kong wasn't that developed yet. It didn't even have a tunnel to connect the island to the mainland. And, they, and there weren't many restaurants. And you know, they, their, their life was quite, they'd have to take a ferry across. And then if you missed your ferry, you'd have to take a boat taxi back. You know, and I thought that was really romantic, that, that life. You know, that, made it a bit more, I like when things get a bit complicated because you really enjoy it, you really pay attention to the details. Um, and I think that's what I found in Nairobi. So when I first got there, there were no malls. There's one or two, like small malls, 
Now there are malls everywhere. The, the, the entire thing has changed so dramatically. And to be witness, witness this change, it's a good thing and a bad thing, of course, because it's kind of destroying the, the culture and the sensitivity of a place if you have big malls and people mm -hmm. change their minds. and The wealth gap is so much clearer, but also it's quite exciting to see new roads and new things build. And I think that's what my parents must have seen in Hong Kong when things started growing and you know, get bigger. And I, it's, not, it's really interesting to be in a place like Toronto is Toronto, and you might have new buildings, you know, the West End is building new glass condos and stuff like that. But to see an entire like, city and country just develop and change so dramatically, it's really exciting to be there. So uh, part of your work is working with um, Time Magazine or other mm -hmm. uh, big news outlets, and you photograph world leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, you photograph people that are just regular people all over the world. And I'm wondering if your view of humanity, seeing such a wide spectrum of people, has changed or developed since you started this work? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, I always try and see people as people, read them, you know, let... I don't know, I remember when my first trips was to the Gaza Strip, and... Uh, Fatah and Hamas were fighting each other, so it wasn't Israelis, it was inter-fighting, and it was quite nasty, because when brothers fight, you know, they really know where to, where to hurt you. Um, so it got quite violent, and it got really scary. Um, and I remember, I, it was weird, because the, Saddam Hussein had, was killed, um, what was hanged, so there was a three-day mourning period, and three-day mourning period is where everybody comes out and you can greet everybody. So I just got there, and there was a three-day mourning period, which meant I could go to anybody and meet them. So the Fatah leader, who was supposedly the guy who kidnapped and tortured people, I could just walk up to them. And I'd never done that, but I've never met a killer. I've never met, you know, so I was trying to figure out how do I approach him. I think that was a lesson, again, these small lessons, was to just see him as a man and find a way to try and understand, put myself into his shoes. Mm -hmm. Why is he doing this? What are his motivations without judging him right away? Mm -hmm. And I think that I do that a lot. I try and put myself into their position or their, how would I react like that? And I can see that, you know, there's moments when you push the right way or the wrong way that you can do some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like humans are very unstable. Yeah. I'm unstable. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm lucky that I'm loved, I, you know, by my family, by my friends. Um, I'm being supported. I can see how quickly things can go wrong. Um, so I try and just put myself into their position. And I think it's such an intimate interaction to take a photo. Mm. How have you learned to sort of put people at ease? Uh, well, it's, you have to be at ease. <laughs> so if you're kind of nervous, then it doesn't work. And I, I went, it used to be easier and then got, it was fine. And then last two, three years, it got really hard. Like I. I almost felt like I didn't want to be a photographer anymore because I felt the camera was really... I would have just hang out with you guys, you know? It's like, I don't want to photograph you guys. Um, but then slowly, these last couple months, again, I, I enjoy it. Like, I don't remember that the camera's there. That's mm -hmm. why I was saying before, mm -hmm. when the camera's there, I really feel like it's, it's between us and mm -hmm. it's awkward and I don't really want to take a picture. I know it's, it's annoying, but that was because I wasn't at ease, you know? I think when you're at ease and, and everybody's calm, then the pictures will flow as well. So it's not so much about the camera, because you could have a big camera or a small camera, it doesn't really matter. It's how you, how you just calmly relate to the people. Has there ever been a time when you met someone and found that your first impression of them was completely wrong? Or you were really surprised by someone? Yeah, it happens sometimes. But I, I try and read people as best as I can. And you know what, this thing about I realized with photography, um, I was working with a filmmaker, um, I think we, as photographers, we don't, we're a bit more distant, you know, we just look at, I look at light, I look at body language, I, I'm not as invested in the conversation. I almost <coughs> don't want to talk, I want to just spend the time and watch you, but I, the filmmaker was, you know, much more invested, much, digging a lot deeper with talking, so I felt like maybe photographers don't, you know, we're a bit more distant, so we don't, I try not to connect too much, you know. It's weird. I try and this is a distance I want to keep. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your aesthetic, are there conscious choices that you make in terms of how you are composing your shots and the sort of look you're going for? Or is that just something that happens? How does that emerge? No, I mean, like every 
part of the picture is I, I there's not a part of the picture that I didn't put in because you know every, I'm, what I'm saying is that everything is consciously put into the into the frame. Right. Um, I'm really picky. I want to keep things simple. I'm like I said, I'm attracted to color. Um, my worst fear is those uh, vests, you know, those re reflective vests, because they're I don't like bright things, you know, I like nice dark red, not bright orange, you know, so I'm picky like that, um, so Thailand, you know, when the Thai, the Thai demonstrators, they all have those on, and they had orange helmets, I would go nuts, I'd be, I'd try, I wouldn't know how to make a picture, because it's just, just, the color ratio is just too hard to figure out. Have, so. have there been big turning points for you in terms of how you've tried to evolve that aesthetic? Have there been sort of moments that have change the way you look at your own photos? Yeah, I think just the more you spend time with one project, you can, you realize that you want to shoot, you know, shoot the mood, get it right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely think it's, depending what it is, but of course yeah, it's all, it's always thinking, it ne it n I never stop trying to figure out. It's like trying to unlock something, you know. So. You mentioned earlier um, about this sort of, you know, the big eye of global media, mm -hmm. that we're all getting all this uh, media thrown at us every day, thousands of images a day, and when the thing in Egypt was happening, you could definitely feel the sort of static in the air of, you know, the mood changed, right? It was charged, yeah. charged atmosphere. And I'm wondering with your work, do you try to go with that? Or do you try to avoid it in terms of the, the sort of dominant narrative that's happening in an event? Um, how do you, how do you navigate yourself versus this sort of big narrative or the sort of eye of the world looking at a place? Well, I, I think one of the important things is to never, not just look straight, but look left and right. I think one of my favorite pictures is during this whole storm of, well, after Mubarak resigned, everybody's on the streets and shouting and flags in the air. And I remember looking into a car and there was a baby sleeping. And that was, it was a really quiet moment. And I really like that picture for that quiet moment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just looking straight, but looking, looking around, trying to get a sense of sense of the place without having always going for the obvious. I mean, the obvious is going to tell you one thing, but I feel like if you look around left to the right, you'll get much more subtle kind of details. Has there ever been a time where photography, photography as a medium felt uh, inadequate for what you wanted to say or what you wanted to communicate? Yeah. I, yeah, of course. I think th some things are just so complex that it's two ways. The pictures can give you a feel and a mood and, and transport you there. But sometimes I also feel that maybe we need more information about this, this particular case or story. Mm -hmm. Especially the nuclear radiation project, you can't see radiation. So I'm trying to make pictures of something that doesn't exist. Um, it's pretty hard. Um, I, think that, I think that with filmmaking, sound, people talking, stories, you can get much more of a bigger sense. So I was going back and forth, was, should I start filming this or do I keep photos? And, and then I realized that the photos work as well. They, could, they transport you in a different way. It's just got two different languages. So how does your editing process work? When you come back from a place, you have thousands of photos, what is it like to sort of dive into those and how, what are you looking for? Um, well, I'm stalling right now. I, Normally, when you're working on a on assignment, you're like you're, you're shooting. And then the night, you look at all your selections. You select which ones you think the magazine should get, and you do this every day for the three days or five days you're on assignment. But now with the personal work, I started doing something I've never done before: is I started shooting, uploading, and not looking at it. So I have a bunch of days. I think two weeks, three weeks that I haven't even looked at. I'm a little worried. I haven't looked at them because I'm, you know, it's a daunting task and. Um, there's a lot of bad pictures too, so <laughs> until you edit it down, you, you find like the top 100 or 150 and then, and, the, and then you get a bit more comfortable. So, yeah. Okay, I have two more questions for you and I think we can see if people have anything they want to ask. Mm. Um, the first one is, sometimes when I look at your work, it, I mean, I kind of feel on a personal level that it's very relatable, it's very human. Um, and this might seem a bit out of left field, but I wonder, is there any sense in which you see your work as a self-portrait? Or that you're conveying something about yourself or about larger issues outside of the subject that you're looking at at the moment? Um, 
I th mm. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's a self-portrait, but it's definitely like the things I'm interested in or I want to, I of course always want to say something more. Mm -hmm. um, especially this work, I think, is I wanted to get more into the magic of the place and almost transport you out. So give you little references of where you are, you know, sometimes even making you think you're, in, you don't know where you are at all. Like, how is this even possible that there's white water, you know? Um, so I was trying to, I thought that if, if I transcend and make it almost fictional, it's all real, but almost fictional, that it, it would bring you in closer. That the, the really real stuff that you're seeing on the internet is, you're just, you're so used to it that you, you just, it just sink, it doesn't sink in. So I thought if I almost bring a new, new level to it or a different kind of s s way of s telling a story that mm -hmm. people will be hooked more. So it's always, obviously that's the, that's what we're trying to do is try, trying to get as many people to look at the work, you know, and, and, and see the situations we saw. And I'm also interested in your work, there's always this edge of violence or chaos. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering what, what draws you to that? Mm. Um, and also to sort of contrast that with the beauty of the way that you frame the scenes, that's something that always was really striking to me, that these subjects are really intense mm. situations, like, wow, what's going on here? Mm. But the way that you framed it is, is so calm and peaceful. Um, and I've always wanted to know if that's intentional or how that sort of emerges. No, it's intentional. I mean, uh, it's intentional. Sometimes I don't even know. I don't even know that I'm doing it. But I think I I, I grew up with theater, uh, and I'm in theater you always have the stage. So I I om om always think of the stage. I think, and, and then I place my characters into the stage, uh, and the backgrounds, the set design, and, and I think that I'm, I work like that. Um, so yeah, I de definitely think it's conscious decision of how to s set a scene, which is why, that's why I'm paying attention to clothing. Like really want to make sure the clothing is right, right palette, the the colors are right. I get really upset if the like the two different colors of lighting come into the picture, things like that. You know, if and that's all part of set design in a way, mm -hmm. uh, to give in the scene to make it as perfect as possible. Mm. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Are there any questions from... That's a really good question. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I, I don't think I'm an activist because I, I feel like you have to stay objective and activism, uh, activists aren't objective. They have, a very, they have an idea that they're going after and they usually don't, don't take in the other idea too much because that's the whole point, right? So I, I don't think I, I'm an activist, but I understand what you're saying. I think sometimes things can also be taken out of context or, or like with the, with the Japan issue, I think if I start talking about it, they'll, they'll listen to that part, but no, won't listen to the other part. Mm -hmm. Because part of my project is also to look at the pro-nuke people and why are there nuclear stations, going into nuclear stations, getting connected to workers, mm -hmm. meeting them, why is this here? So it's not just anti-nuke, it's also pro-nuke people. Yeah. But yes, of course, I'm a little scared that we're, we're all more paranoid because the world is changing and we're on live streaming right now. And you know we're also worried about our phones being bugged and things like that. Um, so uh, I, that's just where, the, where you stay careful. And, you know, Peter's situation, the fact that he was there only two weeks and then got picked up by the Egyptian, uh, you know, police and has spent four months, almost more than four months now, in prison for something he didn't, nothing he did wrong other than being a journalist. I mean, I'm really angry at the situation. I'm trying to, you know, I, I almost want to, I want to do more than protest um, because I think it's ridiculous that, that even the Americans, that people are, and this is the government stuff, that they can get away with so much. I mean, they can ruin people so easily with, and we have no power against them. Um, so that makes me angry, I guess. Um, but yeah, there's a fine line. You always got to be objective. So I, I don't want to ruin my chances with Japan because I'm not done yet. Once I'm ready to for, you know, show my work then, and make a conscious decision that I maybe not be able to go back, then that's okay. 
I just photographed the Prime Minister, so I think I can give him a call, though, so it'll be okay. <laughs> um, I photographed him with a little like point-and-shoot uh, camera, and he thought it was really funny, so I think he'll remember me. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think like some stories, you just make a conscious decision that you won't be able to go back. I have a friend who hasn't been back to Somalia because he really did a strong story. He's part of the representation, Ed O, when he did his child soldiers. And he, we talked about it. He knew that once he shows that there's child soldiers in the Somali transitional government, that he probably won't be able to go back. And that was kind of like something that was a you know, conscious decision, I'm sure. So, I w like I said, I wish I could protest more with Egypt. I don't know how. And I don't think, you know, it's just a situation that we can't change. But it's, it's ridiculous that they're all in prison for having done nothing. Thank you. No, thanks. Yeah, I think in the, I'm saying old days, but I think pre, pre-internet, and this is still new, the internet and, and the communication with, with the internet, with our pictures. I think in the old days you could be a magazine photographer or, or a wire photographer and have your aesthetic and it wouldn't be the same frame. I, I mean, like you said, the pictures are kind of different situations, but the shots are kind of the same. Um, I think, I guess, the artist, I'm uncomfortable calling myself an artist because I think I'm, I'm a journalist before an artist, um, is to find your language. And I, and I guess that's where the art part comes in, that, that it's a, it's, you're looking to change your photography and, and, and bring in a language that nobody else has, or, or a way of presenting work, or situations or scenes that somebody doesn't have. So I think that's where the art part comes in, that, that uh, that's not regular, because magazines don't know what to do with it. Like, it's a bit hard for them to, you know, publish things like this. Um, so I guess if it can be in magazines, it gets pushed over to the art world. I think books as well, that's you know, making books, I think that's more part of the art that you can create your book and make it in any pacing, any feel you want. And being an artist, I guess, being having an authorship role in your, in your work, rather than giving off the pictures to editors who then make their own selection and their design and everything. So it's, you're more of a photographer, photojournalist, if this all makes sense, yeah. I, I'm just, the art, I, I guess I don't know. Like I, <laughs> I, can, I can talk around it, but I just make, Yeah, sorry. When I, I realize I don't have to like explain everything if I don't if I can't <laughs> explain it, because I'm shooting and I'm and I'm pr it's pretty prim prim primal mm -hmm. when I'm photographing. It's not a lot of thought going forward. But yeah, that kind of image I wanted to. Yeah, I didn't want to give you the literal definition of what you're looking. I wanted to bring you into something deeper or something darker. I think I was fascinated with films, filmmaking, and I'm trying to do that with one picture. I'm trying to pull you in and then let you imagine the surroundings and let you smell it. And I think if you go to li too literal, you're giving the answer away already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do is almost give you no answer. And hopefully you're, you'll use your imagination to bring it in a world uh, that adds to it. I think that's, and that's, that's very, uh, I mean, it's, when I'm shooting, I, I, that's what I want to do, I think. And I'm looking more and more for this. And it's I, the poetics of the image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Both are good questions. We almost should have a discussion group. <laughs> um, thank you both. Uh, any other questions? Again, a good question. Um, I think you have to make, you have to accept it, and you have to talk about. I have to know why I'm going. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like 
put myself into a scene and kind of take their take a little piece of them if I didn't know why I was doing it. And sometimes they like the subjects would know why, but I know that this is really important. I, we need to do this. But you make everybody at ease. There's a conversation about it. If there's not, there's some sort of energy, and I try and open up my open myself up so they can see that I'm honest, that I'm not evil. You know that that I'm not trying to use them in the wrong way. That I'm fighting for them, or I'm trying to explain the situation. Um, I photograph my family the same way. So, I, you know, if anybody asks, would you go to your own family and photograph the funeral, photograph the body? And I, I would say yes, I have. And that's that was that's my way of like explaining it to myself that if I can do it to my family, and I figured out a way, which is the really the hardest thing, try and explain it to my mother that I am going to photo do this. Then, then it's okay to do it with others if, if I know why I'm doing it. And it's, that's always the big thing. Like, I've, I've been in situations where I didn't take a picture or didn't go that extra step because I didn't know if it, this would fit for the story. I didn't want to bother people. I didn't want to, I don't know, just, think, you know, just change, yeah, do that. Like, just change that, their lives mm -hmm. and maybe put them through pains that they wouldn't have to go through again. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, <laughs> I don't, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's pretty stressful. <laughs> it's hard to like create, like you think you have to create the genius thing, it's never gonna happen, you know? So I, you have to go to a place where you're just shooting again and it's okay, you're just a simple person. You, know, you don't have to think of all the pressures. Like in anything, I think, any, 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 any life kind of situation, if you start getting stressed out because the weight is too heavy, then you won't be moving too far and too fast you'll probably stumble. So I think it's trying to just do, do things sim simply without having that big thing over your head. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much.